Ready, steady indeed, and we're off. How you doing, folks? Good to see the gang. Shimera, Darius, Honda Pimp, Axion, Young Lena. Cool to see you all. All right, this week, uh, yeah, this week we're doing Vario. Thanks for the heads up on the audio and video. That's great to hear. I've just got, you just know the drill now. This is excellent. Uh, <laughs> go on, Shimera. If you believe in yourself, we'll all hear you. Um, all right. Was I distracted myself now? I'm a little out of it today, as we'll see. There's a, uh, yeah. I got a bunch of notes, so hopefully I'll remember to actually go through everything. Um, yeah, today we are looking at Vario, which is the Lisp to GLSL compiler that is, it, it's standalone, but it's also uh, used by Keppel for the actual translation bit. Um, so we're going to dig into that uh, in a minute. And first, I just want to go through a quick recap because there's been some stuff happening this week. The first one has been a big old refactor on Vario side. Um, this... This uh, stream, I was a bit, I was feeling weird about because I was, like I said, I wanted to do some big refactors next month and and really take time with it. But the more I was thinking about doing this stream and it immediately becoming out of date, I was just like, oh, fuck that. Like, we're going to do it this week. So um, I'm going to go into that to show you what I've done there in a minute. The other stuff is that they, um, all the Keppel documentation that I showed last week is um, thanks to Shimera's staple library is now in Markdown, um, so there should be there should be lovely links everywhere, and I'll show it just for my happiness. Where is it? So we should have on all of these now. There's cross references to all different things. That's cross references, not cross references, because I can't speak anymore. Uh, so yeah, if you click on anything, there should be a tags everywhere, and it's all it's all good toys. So that's cool. I also did the libraries. There's a library called Seal Soil. Okay, let's step back. There's a library called um, LibSoil, which is awesome. Uh, and it's used for image loading and it can load straight into GL textures and all that stuff. It's a great tiny C library with no other dependencies. And I did a wrapper for it ages ago, a few years ago now, when I finally wrote up documentation uh, because humans are using it. If you're wanting to use this from Keppel, there's actually another library called Dirt, which adds a couple of extra helper functions on top of this. So it's recommendable to check that out as well. Again, Markdown all over the place, though there's less cross-links in here because it's a teeny tiny library. Right, next up was... Oh yeah, during that refactoring, I had a look at basically the, the def pipe syntax that I was showing last time. Let's bring up... What were we playing with last time? Well, let's just bring up Fragment. Uh, main. Oh yeah, by the way, this week's going to be very low, in fact, probably no graphics this week because we're going to be just looking at the compiler and code. You'll just have to look at code all day. How hard for you. Um, yes, so this before down here was um, def g pipe. Now, there's a few things wrong with this. A, like, I mean, it was a, it was a kind of tidy syntax and it made me smile, but there's a lot wrong with it. Like, so the arrow symbol isn't pipe, really. That's arrow functions. And it was a nod to a Haskell paper that I was inspired by, but hadn't read very much of. So again, it's very different. And um, def g pipe doesn't really tell anyone of anything about what this is. So this has been changed back to def pipeline. Um, yeah, def pipeline g. Um, and the other, like, so def g pipe will work until end of December this year, and then I'm pulling it out. So that's how long we've got to update code, as if anyone's actually writing stuff in Keppel right now. But damn it, principles. Um, there's also a few other things that have changed, but definitely no one will be using them because I didn't even tell them they're in um, Keppel. You have uh, GPU lambdas, if you can spell them correctly, um, which you can compile into, they used to be just gpipe, which could take GPU lambdas at runtime and create a pipeline as an anonymous pipeline you could then pass around. So it's again like defun and um, lambda. It was def pipeline and pipeline. So this now is just pipeline g, and it will take some GPU lambdas and good to go. That's a super experimental feature, but it is documented now, so that means it's kind of out there for people to abuse. And yeah, pull and push g should also work on those uh, GPU lambdas. So if you just want to play with that, that's also cool. Anything else? No. Oh, yeah, that was a question. Yeah, definitely you guys can answer. Apparently, up 
this side, apparently top left corner, um, I've got a some overlay from Twitch. Are you all seeing that, or is this just this one bloke's computer? Because I don't see that when I'm on Twitch. But I don't know what's going on there. And while you think about this... No, cool. That's good to know. Because that would have sucked. <laughs> Upper right scratch buffer. Yeah, I know. This was really weird. I got... Oh, I'm fuzzy now. Yeah, sorry. I do this occasionally. I just go out of focus. It's not the camera. It's actually me as a person. Come on, you fuck. Focus, but over here. Really? Are we not gonna... Oh, man. I shouldn't allow... <laughs> okay. Sorry. Let's... Let's deal with this camera shit, then. Let's, uh... Pull it back. Come on. Bring it back in the room. There we are. Autofocus for chumps. I know, dude. Like, I've just been lazy. Just come closer. Yeah, that's what everyone needs is this beard in HD. Um, okay. Right, where are we? Yes. Vario. Okay, so, um, like I said, done some big refactoring. Uh, one of the things that was requested with Vario... Vario used to have a dependency on my maths library, and that was a problem for some people, which is totally understandable. Um, that was a kind of an artifact of it originally being part of Kettle before that split out. Um... So that is no longer the case. I also just wanted to deal with this issue of symbols belonging to different packages in general. So, uh, <laughs> Shimmer, we need to be able to see the pores in your skin, like that super high res picket. No, 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 we don't need to see that. That's just, uh, no. Um, I'm not even gonna finish that sentence. There we go. So, yeah, um, there, there's just an issue of which package owns what symbol. Um, because if you, in your maths libraries, make a version of let's say clamp or mix um, and then you want that to work in vario it would be nice if those symbols were the same so what i do have and this is a package that's kind of if you want to contribute to vario or kepler anyway this package is a really cool place to start there's one called glsl spec now opengl is pretty cool in that it provides its specification the api side um, as an xml so you can generate like your FFI bindings and things from that. But they don't do anything similar for the shader language. And a lot of the shader language is kind of um, documented like this. So they have these gen types that they talk about. So smooth, te te smooth step takes a gen type, which is a float or a vec2 or a vec3 or a vec4, basically any of the float types. And, um, and this is any of the double types. So double, double vec2, double vec, you know, you get the idea. And then, um, but, but what's what's annoying about this, and this why it's useful for... Um, uh, why it's kind of a pain for when you're building the compiler side of it, is that these... It's not actually a correct type, because when when this one is a VEC2, this one has to be a VEC2, and this one has to be a VEC2. Which is just messy. So this is really optimized for humans reading, and the same goes for down here in the version um, section. This tells you what versions of GLSL this function will work with. And it will say just like, oh, gen type. And of course, as a reader, we're like, oh yeah, that just applies to any of the ones using gen D type. But it's a real pain to try and get your compiler, if you're doing one of those, uh, to work with that. So I made a project called GLSL spec, where we have all the definitions for all of the functions unrolled. And um, big thanks to the people who are doing docsgl um, for providing the man pages in a sensible format. And I was able to scrape a bunch of that and then fix up a load of things because there's mistakes in the in the man pages for a start. Also, you need to expand all of these gen types into their respective types for everything. And there is a lot of this. But from this, we can generate loads of other things. Like um, for a start, all of the functions as JSON data. So this project isn't just for Lisp. This is also um, for bas yeah, basically any language that consume JSON. Um, so we define everything in the Lisp files, and then we just run regenerate. Well, there's a regenerate um, function in here, which will generate the JSON files. And it also spits out in the symbols directory, this package, which has all of the types and functions and symbols but with lispy names. Um, and this means that we have a package which is called GLSL symbols right here, 
that we can, or each of us use, it provides no functionality, it's just the symbols in a package. And then we can, like each of us can have our own maths libraries or whatever, and we can use the same symbols if we want that kind of interop. That also might mean we step on each other's toes. It, this seems like the least worst option for now. It's one of those areas where the CL packages are not exactly ideal for what we want. But yeah, but basically if a function, if you want to know what Vario supports as far as functions are concerned or variables, you come to GLSL spec. If it's in here, it's in Vario. And so basically it should be all of GLSL and all the versions and all that kind of stuff. So if you ever find a bug, fix it there and you fix a bunch of projects. Okay, let's see, uh, young Lena. Um, is Keppel a great place to start if you want to get into graphic stuff? I'm biased, so I'm a weird person to ask on this side. But to me, it sits in a kind of sweet spot between um, it's still GL and you're still working with the GL model, uh, but it's been made lispy. So it feels like it's part of the language. That was my goal anyway. Um, that's for other people to kind of critique. But yeah, I think it's a nice place to start. Um, but it... It depends if you want to understand the OpenGL layer or if you want to just do graphics in general, in which case Unity might be a better bit. Because I mean, they have so much stuff done for you already. Um, yeah, it really depends what layer you want to go in. Um, yeah, like Shimera is saying actually, yeah, it depends what you want to get. Um, okay, if you're not looking to make a game, yeah, then GL might be quite, like, sorry, Keppel might be quite good because you're still dealing with with close enough to the fundamentals. You're having to make shaders, you're gonna to have to, to make pipelines and you're having to deal with the data on the GPU and the kind of problems and benefits that that presents. But the downside obviously is this is like a niche within a niche. Like this is the tiniest place. So outside of me and the docs I've already written, there's not much, there's not many resources, not a big community yet. But of course I would like one. So um, yeah, it'd be lovely to have more people using. Yeah, of course, you want to be... If you like Lisp, then Keppel can feel quite nice. Um, if you're not, then... I'm not sure what the equivalent projects are in various languages. Um, I know there was, there's was. there been some closure ones. Arcadia is a Unity, like, kind of built around Unity. There's... Oh, man, the names are just eluding me at the moment. I'm under-caffeinated, but... We can work this one out. But I'm going to jump on to the next bit. Which is, we've got a package that owns all the symbols. And now we need to know how to use Vario, because Vario uses all this stuff. So what I've done is, let's go back, and I've got a, a package called Vario Playpen. Now, this is not something for other people to use. This is just, I needed a place to show you guys how to use Vario. So there is almost nothing in here. We have an ASD file, um, which has its dependencies. So we see we're depending on Vario, and we're depending on mymathlibrary.vari. This is an extra system. So basically, I've taken all my maths library, library stuff out of Vario. Um, if you still want to use it, things like the V exclamation mark and stuff like this, um, just depend and use on, depend on this package and use RTG math. If you're using my maths library, basically, it'll all still work. So we've got these dependencies. And then in package, we depend on two important things. There's Vario, and this package contains the functions and macros that let you interact with the compiler, because Vario is just a compiler. It's gonna take lists and it's gonna give you GLSL and metadata as we're gonna see. And then there's Vari, which is the dialect of Lisp um, that Vario compiles, right? So um, you have a SBCL, which is your compiler, and it's compiling common Lisp. We have Vario, which is your compiler, and it compiles Vari. Now, Vari is a dialect of Lisp that is trying to be as much as possible common Lisp. I mean, there are there are differences just out of performance and practicality where we make choices, but I would really like, and of course, it's statically typed, but I mean, I would really like it to be as close as possible uh, to common Lisp because that's where I live and I don't want that mental jump too much. Like I said before, just wanna, wanna focus on the problem, not on the other stuff. And then, of course, I spend ages making libraries rather than actually learning the stuff. So I'm a hypocrite. But it's fun, hypocrisy. So it's okay. Right, let's 
SQL quick load to the plan. And you've seen all of it now. This is the only source file is this empty file. Um, so we are going to start here. Can you see this text? Okay, I think it's the same size as I've had it the other weeks. So just make sure it's all, all coming through. That's also a good excuse for me to drink some coffee. Rock on. Thanks, folks. Let's do it. Okay. In um, Keppel, one of the things it hid from you was the difference between a, 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 a stage in GLSL and a function. Um, Vario doesn't have this abstraction for you. So we are going to be dealing with stages first. So these are your vertex or fragment or geometry or tessellation stages. And they are created um, with a function called make stage. So we can see the arguments down in the mini buffer down the bottom. Um, we specify a kind of stage. So in this case, we're going to do vertex. We can provide the, the in arguments and the uniforms um, to the stage. Let's just make this big for now because it's going to be quite a lot to write. Um, and so we can, the way we do this is we, it's kind of like in def method. You have the argument name and the type next to it. You have, say, let's just say it's the vert and it's going to be a vec4. So that will be one argument. And we can also do the same for uniforms. So let's see, it was um, now and it's a float. And we'll use this for time. We would use this for time or something. Then there's a context. Now a context is a set of restrictions on um, the compilation process. This is a messy thing and it's very kind of old. Right, so Vario is very much still in alpha and some of this stuff is going to change. Not make stage and all that, but there are definitely names of functions I'm not happy with. In this week refactor in the last week, I've tried to create all the packages laid out in the way I want. So Vari and Vario and that split, it was all done in the last three days, three or four days. Um, but there are still things that are changing. And that's the same why there is no documentation yet because it hasn't landed enough. But there are enough people that are asking like, hey, how do I use Vario in my project that I wanna do this stream? So I'm, I'll apologize now and again, I'm sure in the future for any changes I have to make but it just needs to happen somewhere. The context is an old idea. I'd like to split it up into separate. Uh, yeah, actually, like uh, Mifania, it's just like, yep, me. Um, I'd like to split the context up into separate parameters. So you su supply, say, a GLSL version and things like this as separate. But right now, they all live in the context. So the first, the only thing we're going to put in the context for now is the version of GLSL we want to compile for which in this case is 450. Um, other things that can go in there. You know what, I can't actually remember off the top of my head, but I will document it at some point. My brain isn't on full steam right now. And then you provide the body. And because um, Lisp has implicit program in most of its forms, this is, um, well, it'll look like this. If we're making a VEC4, it'll be VEC4, one, two, three, four. So this, is a list of all the forms in your body. So you could have, ah, I don't know, what would be a, well, we can just do another, but let's do a vector two here, one, two. And this will make a stage. There are a couple of other options as well. One that says whether stem cells is allowed, and I'll, I'll explain what stem cells are I, uh, later on. They're a way of um, having implicit uniforms be added to your shader. We'll get there, we'll get there. And the last argument is actually primitive which lets you specify um, which, basically which draw mode, what you're, what you're saying you're drawing. Um, so this can be either, let's just say nil for uh, stem cells for now until we get around to that. It can be dynamic, which means you're not specifying. This is only gonna work in vertex and fragment shaders because they don't deal with primitives directly anyway. Or you can specify triangles or lines, or all the same stuff, excuse me, like we did in Keppel last week. But if you leave this just as the default, this is going to be triangles and stem cells are going to be turned on, but it's not going to affect us right now. If I hit return now, we've got a stage. Nothing so far has compiled. What we've got here is an object, which basically is just storing the stuff that we've told it so far, albeit it's passed a couple of things. So we see the input variables down here and uniform variables have been transformed into these objects. And we'll revisit these Actually, like we can look at them now, um, 
but they're more useful to us when things are compiled. Like this input variable here, you can see its GLSL name is going to be vert um, as a string and the name on the Lisp side is vert and its type, you can see here, a uh, type object, which has been uh, transformed from this type specification into a type object. We'll get to those too. So anyway, we've got ourselves a stage. I'm just gonna stick this in temp variable quickly. Temp zero, we have a stage. And then we just pass this to translate. Oops. And now it's compiled. So let's put this in a variable because we're gonna need this quite a bit. If we inspect temp one, oh, come on fingers. We can see there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. Um, we have obviously the GLSL code, which was the result of the compilation. So this is our stage compiled. We can see here our VEC2 and our VEC4 has been returned and has been, because it was the last form, it was the return value, which means because it's a vertex stage, it's become the GL position. Um, we can see that there are a list of, um, let's have a look. We have the primitive in and out, not specified here. Um, we have the stage that we defined, that one we just compiled. We have the uniform variables, the input variables, and the output variables. So let's let's play with those quickly. So if we look at the input variables of temp1, um, we, we can just, um, ah, we can run a few functions on these. So let's take the first one. And we can say, get the type of it. So V type of is going to return the vary type of whatever the object is. And we can see this is a VEC4. And this is an object that represents a VEC4. And these are what are passed around in the compiler internally. Um, they hold more information than just the type because um, vary is able to track values as they flow around your um, your code. So it's able to, it, in some cases, it's able to know exactly what the value will be. It's kind of like dependent types, but very, very baby steps in that direction. Um, if you want to turn this object into a type specification, like up here, then what you do is you say type to type spec, and you pass in that thing. And what it's gonna give you is the specification as a symbol or a list, and we'll see cases where it's list. Um, you'll see here that it's actually a little different than up here. We specified it as a keyword up here, and here is the actual name. So this keyword name is uh, essentially a, a type alias for VVEC4. The reason we have these uh, keyword types is because most of the time when you're, when you're doing um, OpenGL from Common Lisp, you're probably using the CL OpenGL library and using the FFI. I mean, like obviously if you're not using Keppel or something like that, you're probably using one of the other raw libraries and the CL OpenGL bindings are awesome. By using the FFI, um, you're using the FFI types like int and float and things like this. So it made sense to me at the time to be able to use these keyword arguments here as well. So that's that reason, but the actual type name inside the system is gonna be vvec4. To turn a specification into a type instance, again, this is not something you're gonna to need to do very often, but for completeness, I'm gonna show it. You say uh, type spec to type, and then provide in the name of the type. And you'll see that gets the object is returned. There is a second argument to this called a flow ID. Flow IDs are another internal part of the compiler and it's how it tracks where values flow. Um, and it can track them through loops and through function calls and all this. So it's able to tell, even if you pass a, it, it's part of how we do first class functions and all this kind of stuff. We need to actually track where a value will be um, used and what that value will be in certain parts of your shader. Lots of stuff. Um, if you want to specify an array, it's done by a list. So this will be an array of 10 um, three by three matrices. And you'll also find that we can query the size of a type. Now a GL size, if you've done any, um... <laughs> so how complete is my loop implementation? Thank you, Shamira. It's not, would you care to submit a PR? I would love to have a loop implementation. Um, 
when you're defining a vertex shader, the inputs at the top have to be, um, you know what, it's actually just easier if I show you. Let's, let's go get our, let's get our compiled shader here and just call GLSL code on it. Right. When you pass in arguments, they're going to have a location. And the location depends on the size. So if I pass in, say, let's go and re change our stage a little. This is going to be a map three, and then this is going to be a vec four. We'll go this A, and B will be a vec two. Uh, we're going to compile this by calling translate on it, and then we're going to call GLSL code on that. Okay, we can see that the location um, of A is three because the size of mat th of uh, matrix three in GLSL is three. And it, it's one of these things you just normally have to deal with and I don't like dealing with it. So this system works it out for you. Um, what's important then is that you're able to take types like our um, array of uh, matrix uh, mat threes here. I'm just gonna call it mat three and get the GLSL size from it. So it should be GLSL size or is it VGLSL size? This is the kind of stuff I'm not happy with. Some of these functions are prefixed with V for some reason, and some of them aren't. And it's like, oh, I'm, I've got to clean this up and then it'll be documented. And then I'll say it's beta rather than alpha. Anyway, you can query the size on any type. So if we say this is a float, then you can get the size or a vec3 and a vec, and you see that vec2, vec3 and vec4 are the same size and all this kind of stuff. So it can do that calculation for you, also for structs, which we'll get to at some point soon. Two, back to temp one. So we have our uh, input variables for temp one. Also, please, I know I'm a bit scatterbrained today, so shout out the questions in the chat so I can cover everything. Um, we, will, we will get it done, we will enjoy. Okay, so you can get the name of this input variable, you can get its GLSL name, you can get its type, and you can get something else as well, which I can't remember. Oh yeah, you can get locations if it's an output variable. So you, these uh, output variables are pretty much the same as the input variables. The type of GLSL name and all that stuff works on them. But if you're compiling a fragment shader, the outputs from a fragment shader also have locations. Um, and so you're able to query those as well. You'll see if, um, yeah, I would have to compile a fragment shader. Um, <laughs> ask and you shall receive. I ask for questions, I get questions. They're not relevant to the compiler. Um, I, I, I will answer them, but I'm gonna go a little further on this because I'm so derailed already in my head. So we have input variables, output variables, also works the same for querying uniforms. Ah, come on fingers. Uniform variables. Same kind of stuff, same style objects. Query out the details you need. Um, and then of course, the most important part of all this is always the actual code, which you just get with um, GLSL code. So this is really what we're after. Pass and Lisp, get some uh, code out the other time. Edge of ad, mission distract baggers success. Oh, it's working, it's working. I don't need help right now, but it is working. Um, let's, uh, go back to the play pen and we can start using some of this. So for the sake of sanity, I. I don't like writing, I mean, the, the core compiler, which is the um, make stage and translate is all very well and stuff, but it's a little, it, I mean, it's just a function that takes some lists. So I'm gonna wrap this in a macro to make things a little easier. Uh, so def macro, uh, I'm gonna just call it def shader. And then we'll have kind, we'll have args, and um, we'll just do uniform separately for now. And body, body. And then we'll just call this. I'll swap out kind. 
and args and uniforms. And so this is again how you would start if you wanted a much lighter weight version of something like Keppel. You can start wrapping some of these compiler things up in uh, macros and things. And body. That should be enough. No, it's not because I haven't put a back quote. Yeah, that'd be fine. Defun test and dev shader. Oh, we do like defs inside defs. That's a great style. Um, a int nil. And we can write some code. So one, two, three, four. Oops, what did it not like there? Cool, we're four, once at least five. What have I missed? Kind, args, uniform, and body. Oh, come on, brain. Oh, of course, it's the um, it's this. I've exper I haven't. I've missed something here. Oh yeah, I've missed a context. That's why. Idiot. Right. Four fifty. That'll do. We'll just hard code that for now. We call test, and we get a compiled thing. Let's put GLSL code around here because we're most interested in that. So this is how we can start wrapping these things up. Um. Oh, Chimera, feature request, rename all the def star to define star so that slime highlights them properly. That's interesting. I didn't know uh, define did it like that, but that's not a terrible idea. Um, feel th free to raise an issue on GitHub and I'll, I'll look at that. Mm, the sound of drinking. Right. Um, yes, so we being able to write these shaders is cool. Um, we've already seen from GLSL spec that we've got all the functions from GLSL. Um, but obviously we want to be able to define our own types. The most common way of doing this is with VDEF struct. And this is just defining a struct in GLSL. So we can make, say, our own uh, vertex type maybe. It has a context. Again, I'm going to ignore it for now, which just means it'll work in every version of GLSL. Um, and we're going to add some slots here. So maybe we have a position, which is a vec4, and we have a normal a norm, which is a vec3. We compile that, and now the struct is available in all of our shaders. So we could say um, in here that we're going to pass in a uniform called foo, which is of type vert. And then when we compile this, we can see that we've got this here now. So it knows how to do that. It's also added the struct definition up here. Um, another thing that is in the compiler result, actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this very quickly. We do let, ah, no, maybe we can do this. Let's do this in the macro so we don't have to, no. Changing my mind every two seconds. Result is this. And then we're going to return two values. Uh, the GLSL, oops, the GLSL code of result and result itself. And make sure we've actually wrapped that around. Okay. So when we use any types, I'm going to find out now if I've actually exposed this. But we also get a list of used types. So let's, it should be in here. It does track it in the compiler. Maybe I actually haven't exposed that in the output. No, it mentions functions. Okay, I'm talking rubbish, ignore me. It doesn't tell you what types it's found. If that's useful to anyone, um, exactly what types have been used in the shader, let me know. It's really easy for me to add to the output. But yeah, we have structs anyway. We're able to define them. We're able to pass them around. You can pass them to functions and all that kind of stuff. Um, the next thing on our list, oh yeah, actually, before I go any further, I will say that, point out that if you want to do type to type spec to type, obviously now works on your vert type as well, including getting the um, GLSL size. 
so that you know exactly how big it is, which is important, again, when you're dealing with layouts. Um, to be honest, there's, once you've started compiling, there's not too much stuff you need because what you generally need are the names of the uh, things that are being passed in. So you want to know what this variable is called in your vertex shader, and you want to know what outputs you have from your fragment shader, and you want to know the names of your uniforms. And those are all things we've already seen you can just get. Um, there is another way of defining types. If you want to have a type which doesn't exist in GLSL in any meaningful way, but it can be represented by another type, that we can do this. We can say vdef type. Um, we could say, let's do a complex. And we can't take args yet because I don't handle complex um, type expressions in my def type yet, which is kind of same. And we say that the um, the GLSL type that this is going to be. So we're going to define complex numbers using vector two. When we compile this, Coma Lisp is going to complain at us because we violated their package uh, because complex is a name that belongs to them, which is fair. That's totally fine. So what we're going to do for now is just we're going to call it v complex, and we'll get back to this in a minute. And now we're going to want to define some functions because we need a way to create one of these. Now there's two styles of functions that you can declare inside Varia. The first one, of course, is with something like vdefun, where you're defining a Lisp function. Um, and so it can be foo, and then you specify your arguments and the return. And at the moment, this is just a declaration of a function. It hasn't actually compiled it at all. It's not gonna tell you if there's any syntax errors or anything like this. If you want it to do that eagerly, you have to make it do that. Again, the tools are in the compiler to do this kind of stuff. Um, but you can now go and use it in your shaders. So if we do foo here, it's going to complain. Of course it's going to complain, because this is my um, shader up here. Okay, and we can see that our function that was defined here is now declared, and the implementation is provided, and it's a vec2 and all that kind of stuff, and it just, that stuff works. But the other style of function that is allowed is a GLSL template function. So it looks like this, def, and I can never remember the name. Um, wait a second, def GLSL. I've kind of confused myself, one second. Oh yeah, it's gonna be vdef. Again, stuff like this is still what's catching me out. I find it really disappointing. When the API is saying, I'll be happy, right. We're going to get rid of foo, or at least move it out of the way. Let's just stick it up here because we're not going to need it. We want a constructor for our complex type, and it's going to be called complex. And its args are going to be, and again, the syntax this is a little odd. We're going to have a real part, an imaginary part. Uh, the transform is written, I'm going to just move it down here, actually. The transform is written like format string. So you're actually going to write the GLSL um, and inject in the things that you want. So we're going to say vec2 like this. And then we define the types that it takes, which is a float and a float. And its return spec is a v complex. And the other things uh, that are um, other options, v place index and GLSL name are some internal details that I'm going to skip on now. The uh, place index is related into how um, setf is handled. So you can do set f of a ref of an array and it knows how to handle that kind of stuff i'll document that and then that'll be make sense um and the and GLSL name i'm not going to cover but pure is kind of useful pure just tells the compiler this is a pure function it doesn't have any side effects it's good for it to know because there's some places then it can optimize the output GLSL or remove functions entirely if it knows what's going on okay so now we've got this now we can say complex one two and we can see here that it's compiled to VEC2, just like we specified here. And if you go and stick this in a variable, x, oops, we can see it creates a variable of type VEC2 and all that kind of stuff. So it's actually using a VEC2, but you can't, the important bit is this is a separate type. So if you do x plus and then provide a VEC2, the compiler is going to complain at you and saying, hey, there's no way to add a complex and a vec2. If you want that to work, provide a definition for it. 
Um, these functions also have another difference from our vdefund functions up here in that template functions can have at rest arguments. And in this case, you would say at rest, imaginary part, and then you have to use the same at rest in the types. Again, the fact that these are separate, I have no idea why. It was probably a reason when I started this. Uh, or maybe there wasn't, maybe I was just dumb. Um, but I'd love to tidy this up. But anyway, yes, we support a variable number of arguments in template functions. Of course, then, if you're using variable numbers of arguments, you're gonna to want to use um, format iteration to make sure you get everything in and you probably want to say, you know, comma, that kind of stuff. But we'll leave this here. Now, when we look at um, common lisps complex function down the bottom left there, we can see that the imaginary part is optional. So what we're gonna do is come up here and just define a second definition. We don't support optional yet. It's something I'm thinking about, but I haven't done just now. And we just say this to zero. And now we can have complex zero here. Oops, come on, complex zero, complex one. And then we could define um, addition for complex numbers, for example. We could say plus for C0, C1 um, is going to be plus V complex, V complex, and the result is V complex. And then we should be able to go down here and say plus C0, C1. And so already we're extending GLSL with types that don't exist in GLSL and it's type safe and all this and we can't just combine things in weird ways. So between structs and um, VDEF type, we have quite a bit of flexibility. And of course, if you use um, V complex as an input to your shaders, you're gonna then want to handle that transformation yourself uh, oh yeah, there's one other thing. It's kind of annoying that our type had to be, say, say we were gonna pass this in as a uniform, for example. So say V complex is passed in like this. And we wanna add foo to the Z1. Not that foo, this foo. Right, so it works, but the fact we still have to say V complex rather than the proper comma lisp type is kind of a shame. So what we can do is we can go up to here, for example, and we can say add equivalent type name. And we can say V complex is the same, oh no, sorry, complex is the same as V complex. So we're just creating a type alias. Whoops. And it's a function. Again, I should probably have a def version of that as well. We'll have to see, this is the kind of stuff that's all up for review in the API. But now we can come down here and we can use complex everywhere. I'm just gonna use it here for now. And we'll see that this, Oh, no, did I mess that up? Existing name, new name, damn. Now that probably is gonna confuse the compiler. Ah, oh, what have I done? Okay, damn. <laughs> hmm, and this is one of the times I'm gonna, just realized I'm gonna need a delete. Actually, wait a second, maybe there is one. Remove equivalent type? No. Delete. No. Okay, I need to I need to have a remove equivalent type. Or you make yourself look like an idiot on the stream. But anyway, yes, you can define type aliases. We need a way of undefining them. Uh, if someone wants to add uh, that to the uh, GitHub issues list, that will get done ASAP. Uh, I have been away from the chat for a while because I've been rambling. So let's see what's been going on. Uh, Yoglena, did I write my own compiler? Yes, this is Vario. This is this is what I've been working on, well, bumbling through slowly. Um, but it's starting to get all right, other than the actual user interface for it. See, for Keppel, it's fine, because I get to deal with all the crap, and I can just make Keppel look nice, and then however the API for Vario is, I just deal with. Um, but writing this kind of stuff in Lisp is just... Getting started is really easy. And that's actually why the function is called translate and not compile. 
because I didn't know what a compiler really was. I, I used compilers like, you know, that's the thing that takes the code and makes it machine code. So it makes it into a program so I can run it. But I, uh, but I thought that this stuff, this translating stuff, that wasn't compiling. I was an idiot, didn't know what I was talking about. But the fact that you can do this kind of stuff in Lisp by accident is cool. That's fun. Uh, tedious though, surely some parts were some parts were tedious. Actually, writing the compiler is great fun. It's one of those times that it's perfect for programming languages because there's no humans involved. The input is a data structure and the output is a data structure. Like so rarely in programming do you have that. Um, the rest of the time you're having to deal with, oh yeah, you know, all this is async and the server's down and all that crap or you're dealing with a UI, in which case you're having to deal with humans and how they touch things and it's disgusting and just, it's so complex, whereas compilers are surprisingly, you know, like making a simple compiler is simple and it, it's a lot of fun. Um, then, uh, yeah, Keppel mode for Emacs. To be honest, it should, like if it's not, um, that you should have autocomplete already. If you're using defungi, it creates a dummy Lisp function in the background. So things like um, argument highlighting and all that kind of stuff, argument, like jump to definition, lists of arguments down in the mini buffer, all that already works. The only thing that's missing is I can't provide the type information in the mini buffer. That would be cool. But you can also have overloading, so I'm not entirely sure how that would work. We would have to extend slime to allow that kind of stuff. And I don't think that's happening anytime soon. There are some stuff I'd like to do with slime though, which would be cool. Um, right. We've looked at basic compilation of things. Now, I think it's nice to use translate um, on individual stages. I don't think that's, like, I, th I think it's cool and it works, but I would say Vario's strong point is when you start compiling multiple stages at the same time. So if we go back up to make stage and we are gonna let's just make some shader let's, so let's just say let x is that will say these are the uvs and this function is going to return two values it's going to return a vec4 which is actually going to just be vert and it's going to return uv All right so that's the first stage and we're going to make a list of stages and now we're going to provide a fragment stage so make stage fragments the arguments passed from the vertex um, stage the first one is going to be taken as the gl position and the second one all the rest are going to get passed on so the input for fragment right now is going to be a vec2 and i'm not going to have any uniforms for now and the context is going to be the same this kind of tedious stuff where you see duplication that's what as as someone using this compiler that's what you hide away from your users so to jump back to the packages very briefly, I'm just going to belabor a point. Um, what was it called? Varia Playpen. Your users should be using Vari, right? That's the thing they should use in their projects because that provides all the shader language. You should be using Vario and maybe Vari as well um, because that's where the stuff for interacting with the compiler is. Done. Right, and the code is going to be you know what, let's just, let's just make it simple. We'll just return red. So vec, I oh don't know, we'll just return white. Vec for one, like, um, oh yeah. He expected this version to be a keyword. We have two stages. And now what we can do is call rolling translate. Now what I like about this Whoops, in Vario, it's not valid to have a let with an empty body. That's correct. There we go. It's compiled both the stages. And if we run GLSL code on that list, we can see the code for both the stages. Now, what's good about this is it's it defines um, interface, what do you call them? Interface blocks um, that match on both sides it's able to um, type check to make sure that the inputs to the fragment shader are the correct ones that have come out of the vertex shader. And it, it's, um, if you're dealing with tessellation and geometry, it's going to pass through that primitive that you specified, and that's going to go through as well. 
And so in that case, it's able to check to make sure you're using the right primitive in the right place and all these kind of things or not accessing, say if you've got triangles, you can't access element four because it's not a quad, it's a triangle and it will check for that. All that kind of stuff it's able to do for you. It, when you pass a value from the vertex shader to a geometry shader or to a tessellation shader, it gets arrayed by the length of your primitive, stuff like this. Vario does that for you. All of these kind of things, if you're using rolling translate, is super handy. Um, and once again, because you've got both of those objects up here, this is gonna give you lots of information. So things like the location zero out of this is something that you can query. So if we go and compile this again, we're lazy, second of that, and then we say the output variables, of this, we take the first one of those, whoops, first one of those, and we get its location. It's at location zero, and that's the kind of information you're gonna want when you're dealing with frame buffer objects, or again, up uploading uniforms, inputs to verdict shaders, all that kind of jazz. So I think rolling translate is probably the thing that's most useful um, in Varia. And that's, that's basically it. You're making stages, just throw them in the translate function. And now I'm gonna get into some of the more funky features. And this is stuff that I've just wanted in Keppel and so has made it into Varia. And the first one is that stem cells thing I was going on about earlier. And this is gonna take a little bit of explanation. So let's take our dummy shader and move it down a bit. Da, 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 da. I'm going to make a list variable called the time and it's going to be a float. I'm just going to leave that there for now. And then what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to get rid of all this complex stuff. Da, da, da. I'm not going to pass in any arguments because I don't need to deal with those right now. And I'm going to say the time, right? I'm going to try and use a top level list variable, a special variable inside our shader. And of course, this thing is going to, let's just call test. This is gonna complain and say the symbol, the time is unidentified. But this might be something we want. We might actually want to provide this automatically for the user as a uniform. Um, so what we can do is we can wrap this in something called with where is it? Stem cell infer hook. No, is it stem cell infer hook? Yes. I think this is the one. Yep. And then we're going to make a function. Let's do lambda. And we're going to be passed a symbol. Then what we're going to do is we're going to return a type. And that's all we want to know. It kept, like basically Vario is saying, okay, you're telling me that this thing that I don't think exists, exists. Just provide me with a type and I'll accept it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go when um, bound p sim, um, we're gonna type case on the symbol value of sim. And for now, we're just gonna deal with uh, integers when we'll return an int and a single float, oops, and we return a float. We wrap the width stem cell infer hook around, and then when we run it, we see that it compiled for a start, right? It's created a variable called the time, and it's 42 because that's the char code of, of star. And it, it, it's usable inside our code. So like we could put this, the time as one of our arguments there. Right? And what this is, what this is called is, is an implicit variable. The stem cell is a kind of type. Um, and what it means is that currently Vario doesn't know what the type is, but it's meant to be inferred from somewhere. In this case, it was able to get it from this hook 
Other times it might look at the context in which it's used. If it's used in a function that can only take an int, then it must be an int, because that's the only way that this will be valid. Stuff like that. Stem cells are kind of hairy and hidden away, but via this hook, you can provide some magic to your users. This is something that Keppel does. So you can use global list variables inside your, inside your shaders and they just get uploaded. Of course, it's been added to the code, but we need to know that it was, right? That otherwise that sucks. So what we can do is we can query the implicit uniforms of what we've just compiled. And then if we look at this object, we'll just look at it in the inspector to save time. We can see the CPU side transform. This is what, this is the code that you need to run on the CPU side in Lisp. And that's the value you're going to upload. And then this is the um, name of the variable that um, the shader is using. This is its GLSL name. This is the type. So you're going to want to convert this back into an FFI type so that you can do the uploading from GL. But that's all the information you need. Now you've got implicit uniforms. This also works. And again, this isn't something you should expose to your user, but can be really handy for you hacking around with stuff or inside a macro or something. Something very similar, which is, I'm just going to make some ugly space and we're going to go, what's it called? Um, Lisp code as uniform. And then we give it a name. Let's just look at, let me just look at the type for this was, oh, what is it? It's, I think it's just name type. So we say vec3, no, we'll just do float again. And then get, I really need something shorter. Oh no, let's just move it down to the new line. Fail, right, come on. Get internal real time. We compile this and again, we run, oh, what have I got wrong? Implicit uniforms call the arguments nil. I've got something wrong there. One second while I go and jump to definition and uh, see what that was. This needs documentation. Um, Barrio internals. Ah, oh, if I could type this, would be way easier. This code, really? Okay, it's probably in very CL. I moved everything around and now I'm confused. Okay, what does it take? A uniform name, yep, a type, and a list form. So that should have been okay. Hmm, I wonder what it didn't like. Okay, I'm not pleased with that. Um, but anyway, we could call some CPU side func, right? And then when we compile this, we get another implicit uniform. Um, and we can see that it's used inside and it is a float. So if we, you know, we can do all the normal things with it, let x is this stuff wrap that around there and we can use x down here we compile it and everything's gonna be fine we're using the time <laughs> and we're using x here which is a float by the name and then what you as a person using this compiler have to do for your users is to again look at implicit uniforms and now you can see there's two implicit uniforms look at this one which is going to give you the Lisp code that you need to run to get the value that they're expecting to be uploaded and that kind of stuff. Again, super hacky, not safe, but really useful in some cases. I use this in, um, for I have a, I have a system which has a, a graph of vector spaces and you can query the matrix for between any two of them. Um, and I use this to do the uploading anyway, kind of cool. When is it getting passed as a uniform? For every vertex or every draw call? Um, uniforms are constant for the entire draw call. That's, the, that's what they mean by uniform. The value is uniform across all invocations of the shaders. Um, so yeah, you provide that when you call... I can't even remember what the names of the uniform upload functions are, but when you're doing your draw call or setting up. 
So that's some dark magic. There is another category of things that... um. Oh, yeah, wait a second. Something more basic. That I've been totally forgetting. And that's... Um, first class functions are supported. So if we go down in here... Doo -doo -doo, we can make a let and we can say fn is sign and then we can go and you know fun call fn with 10 and whoops not call that function because that's the wrong one symbol x is on the phone of course it is because i removed everything to yeah fine that'll do see okay so you're um you're able to create first class functions and pass them around. What and um, what is important is to know that because this is GLSL, there's no real function passing. So Vario is going to try and resolve statically every place that you call it. So if you make, you know, um, another la uh, use like a labels form, and we make something called um, foo call. And it takes, and this is where things are going to get ugly, it takes an f, which its type is function from float to float, and then takes an x, which is a float, and then does the fun call in here. So let's do foo call passing in fn and 10 oh yeah we want to call x here vario should be able to resolve this oh where's oh yeah because it's called f up here vario is able to, to statically resolve what's going to happen this obviously doesn't work if you start trying to return functions from if statements unless vario is then later able to realize that Oh, it's this particular one you mean. But there's a lot of cases where that doesn't work. The first class function support in Vario, and thus in Keppel, really is about um, shader composition. Because one of the things I didn't like was um, mega shaders, where basically you have everything in one big shader with loads of if defs, and then when you compile, you just if use the if defs to like say which chunks of this mega shader are going to be used. I don't like that. I would much rather we pass in functions um, and have them compiled like this. So yeah, that's the basic story on um, first class functions. There are times when things can be ambiguous. So if we make a function called foo, which takes an int, um, oops, x, which is an int, and turns x squared, and we have another foo, which takes a float. God knows why you would do this, but maybe you would. X, oh, Y, 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 and cubes it. And then, of course, you um, you can call foo with one or call foo oops, with a float and all that works. But if you were to take a reference to foo, let's do let fn is foo and the fun call fn with one here it's able to work out that you needed um that you're going to be calling this one um it doesn't remove this one yet which it probably should i'll uh i'll need to upgrade the compiler to make sure it can remove unused functions like this it can do it in some cases not in all um but this one rep this fn right now could uh, contains technically contains both these definitions this is foo for any type we can also do this foo for float and then we when we pass in one we see it called this foo instead the one that takes floats and it converted the input to a float so just know that if you want to be specific when you're taking a function reference you can provide the types as well and that also works in keppel if you're interested in that and I think with that, unless I'm going to get into the really weird stuff, which is um, def type, when we uh, specified this up here and gave it a concrete type, 
That can be nil, in which case what you get is an ephemeral type. And an ephemeral type is one which has no valid representation in GLSL at all, which means the value only can exist at compile time. And there are times when that's useful. Um, I'm probably going to do a video in future on my um, vector space system, uh, which is kind of more alternative away from seeing graphs, but using it for just for transforms. And there it can use uses it for um, yeah for representing a vector space which has no representation in GLSL at all. But that's going deep into the weeds, and I for that area of the compiler specifically is getting an overhaul very soon. So it's probably best I don't try and explain it on the stream because it's going to go out of date fast. But I can do it another one. That is the high level view of Vario, right? So that's like we're an hour and five minutes in. I'm happy to stick around for another, say, maybe to a half past if people have questions or want me to go over anything here. Any details, any questions or on any of the projects, Keppel included, we can we can natter about that. Um, so it's over to you folks. Did I cover what you wanted to see, basically? Thank you, Pomp Pimp. Yeah, Axiom. I remember specifically you were interested in using this and Chimera for that uh, for that case. You were talking about possibly using Varia. Is there any stuff that's worrying you? You want me to address, or is there any stuff that's kind of worth going over? I'm sure. I'm sure Chimera must have a complaint or two. Cool. All right. Well, in that case, I'm probably going to go and watch cartoons because I think I'm done for the day. So thank you so much for um, coming on down. And next week, I don't know what we're going to do next week. There will be a stream next Wednesday. I haven't planned what it's going to be yet. Um, Darius, perfect. Um... I think we might start going through um, the book of shaders dot com. That's some really nice introductory tutorials, and we could we can mess around with those in um, in Keppel and just start learning some stuff. Or maybe I'm really tempted. There's a nice tutorial on physically based rendering, so I might go and do that, and then we can poke around in that on the stream. I don't know. Send in your requests. Always up for doing more of these. So um, thanks, guys. I will see you next week.